I have to make up for last week. I don't know if my children in Toronto are watching, but... Yes. All right. So those who know, know what I just did. Otherwise, it's just going to stay down here because even though we love sports, uh, on Sabbath, we think about other things. Uh, however, uh, they begin with caricatures of, uh, of, uh, of which teams or creatures which teams choose. And unfortunately, the Toronto Raptors have chosen a prehistoric, a antediluvian animal. Did the raptors ever exist? Yes. yes. How do we know this? Fossils. Fossils, yes. Okay, but do they exist today? Yes. No. I don't know that they made it onto the ark. Um, interesting pieces about that. How many toes does a raptor have? Do you want me to show you the cap again so that you know? Okay, a raptor has the three toes of a chicken, kind of like a T-Rex. So, um, yep, there was an interesting time in human history when I believe that humankind did get a hold of the DNA of various animals. And uh, my wife's theory about T-Rex, do you want to hear it real quick, just so we're talking about raptors and then we'll be done? Pit bulls. Antediluvian, meaning before the flood, pit bulls. What is a pit bull? It's a dog. Where does it come from? It's a recognized breed now, but true to its name, it was bred for a reason. What did they do with pit bulls in the past? And actually, what do naughty, naughty people still do with pit bulls today? Dog fighting. So, could it be that T Rex was bred for a very large fighting situation? Big teeth, big claws, not a very big brain. So, just think about it. It's, it's a possibility, it's something to think about when. Humankind get a hold of DNA, um, they may just use it for sport. Okay, so I didn't mean to say that about the raptors in Toronto, but I did need to say hi to my daughter and my son in law, whom I love very much and whom I will see very shortly uh, as we go to a family gathering for a wedding for my nephew. And that is a wonderful thing. Today is Sabbath, but in our series, it is day five. Day five. Okay, quick, uh, quick review, setting the stage. On the first day of creation, God created light. Okay, I'm going to ask the guy, whoever is on the computer at the back, you can now move forward to finding anything you want that has to do with fish and birds. There's your clue about today. Okay. On the second day, there was a separation that took place, and we talked about the separation which God bridges with Jesus. There was a separation that took place between the heavens above and the waters above and the waters below. Okay, So there is a separation, and that is next day, third day, added Dry land. Dry land comes up out of the waters, and now you have water, you have sky, you have dry land, and then you also have water underneath. Speaking of the deluge, or the diluvium, or the anti-deluge, my father-in-law's theory was this, very quickly. You have an orange in your hand. Squeeze that orange and juice comes out from inside the skin. No? Yes. In fact, we had what we called uh, oranges that have that thin skin that is very difficult to peel. Our family calls them sucking oranges. 
because they were the juice boxes before juice boxes were invented. And what we would do is we would mush them up and then we would bite a hole in them and then we would squeeze the juice out of the orange. Then we would stick our thumb in the orange and rip it open and eat the flesh. That, that's what we did with those oranges that have the very tough but thin skin. You can't do it with the, the oranges today, some of the oranges that have the thick skin that peels off very easily. So sucking oranges are like the world. When the flood came, the world shrunk. And these waters that are created on the second day, they came up because it says that the waters came up from the fountains of the deep. And the rains came down from the waters that were above the earth. So when you have the flood situation, you have the reversing of what happened at creation. And today, uh, uh, what, what is it, about 80% of the earth's surface, the seas, 80% of the earth's surface is covered with water. Doesn't leave what probably was the amount of land that was originally given to creation to live on. So what does that mean? Well, if you ask Elon Musk, head of Tesla, head of SpaceX, it means we better get ready to populate Mars because we're running out of space, we're running out of resources here on Earth. So no, he's not a Christian, no, he's not a God believer, but he does, re he does believe that we are running out of the ability to live as human beings in this biosphere. Day one is light, day two is sky. Day three is dry land and the vegetation that goes onto that dry land and the important piece which correlates to Jesus in many ways is the fact that there were seed-bearing plants and that each of those seed-bearing plants would reproduce after their own kind. This is the the plan, this is the way in which God created. It was the way in which he wanted things to happen. And still to this day, we have this happening in our world. An apple tree bears apples unless the farmer gets involved. And we know that there are trees that are apple trees that actually also bear pears. But this is, how shall we say, farming engineering on the fourth day, last week, we talked about the sun, the moon, and the stars. You have light being uh, given to us at the beginning, but now you have our very own star being given to us to delineate the difference between day and night and to also mingle between. Uh, Annika, who, who was with me last week, brought up a very good point, and that is that it's never totally dark. In the universe, as we look out into the universe, it's never totally dark. We have the stars out there that are lighting the night sky. And we are also very interested, of course, when these super moons come out. Sometimes we think that the funny people get all funny at these times. The crazy people love the full moons, and scientists are now finding that we do have physical circles or circuits that we go in that may be attached to the magnetic pull of the world, that the moon, when it's closer, has more effect on certain people. These are all things that we're discovering, but these are things that God put in place in creation week. And again, this pastor believes in a big God, a God who rules the universe, a God who can do whatever he wants. And so if you have a problem, if you're learning in school that you know, this creative process took a very long time as some of my students in another church were learning in another Christian school that there is such a thing as theistic evolution where we can believe that God created it but that he had to create it over long periods of time. Let's be clear here, folks. If we're going to accept that God is able to do anything, that he is omnipotent, meaning 
all-powerful. Let's just let him be all-powerful. Let's let him be bigger than us. If he wants to create in this sphere in a week, let's let him do it. Let's believe that he can and did do this. So now we have the sun and the moon and the stars, and we get to today where you can turn in your, in your scriptures, whether they are paper or uh, digital, and uh, you can come to Genesis. And I want to thank Taya uh, for reading it so nicely. I, I, I like the word team. Obviously, we've talked about the T-E-A-M today, the raptors uh, and, and their, their opponents. And now we're going to use another word in, in Scripture that is the same sound, but is, is spelled T-E-M, T-E-E-M. So you've got two E's and not T-A, T-E-A. Teeming, it's, it, it's a word that, that means lots. Um, if you've been to a place where a net is being pulled up not just a hook and a line, but a net is being pulled up and there's hundreds, maybe even thousands of fish inside that net. You see the water just be, being stirred up as if a liquidizer was, was, was stirring up that water. This is the, the, the picture that I have in my mind of fish, fish teeming. I'm happy to tell you that there are many people whether they believe in God or not, there are many people who are very worried about our oceans. We know less about our oceans than we know about our moon. I just want to tell you, I don't think that should be the case. I'm a fan of Jacques Cousteau and the Cousteau Society who wants to go and explore. And it is one of my uh, bucket list items when I get to heaven that I am going to swim with the fishes because we can swim with the fishes as long as we want and we won't what? We won't die. Ever thought about that? I want to fly with the eagles too. We're going to talk about them. And will we die? No. So you, here you have in creation, you have, you have the creation of fish and they're teeming and you have birds being made in the sky. Now, these, these are part of what has been, the, the stage has been set in days one through four. And now God goes about creating uh, what some scientists or some people would say are beings that feel, sentient, sentient beings, beings that know, beings that have a brain. Um, coming up are things that crawl, things that wiggle, Okay, but right now we're talking about the fish in the sea, which includes everything that you can think of, everything that, that the submarines are finding that are literally miles down in the, in the deep, deep crevices that were, cre I believe, that were created at the flood, the trenches, the Mariana Trench. They're going down, down to the bottom, and they're still finding life forms that are dealing with immense pressure. Some of the fishermen that, that pull animals out of the deep find that when those animals come up, they, they, they almost explode. I mean, it's not a nice picture. But fish that live at these depths, when that pressure down low in the water is released, it's literally their eyes pop out of their heads. Again, it's not a nice picture. But they have, have been made to live in these places. One of my favorite, uh, because I grew up on National Geographic, the angler, the angler fish. Anyone like the angler fish? I think he's pretty cool. You don't like him. Uh, he's pretty scary, I know. He's, his, his smile is about this big. And, and around his lips, there, there are teeth about this long on both sides. And there he sits very quietly, and he has this this dangling lamp out in the black murkiness of where he lives, way, 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 way down in the ocean. And, and other fish, other fish that then become not friends, in this case, fish 
are not his friends, they are his dinner. They come to that light. And, and he, have you ever wondered whether or not those fish will make it into the next world? You know, I wonder. I, 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 I do believe in microevolution. I do believe in adaptation. Okay? But uh, I, I just wonder, when the Bible says that the lion is going to lie down with the lamb and eat grass, don't think he's going to need the same teeth that he has now to eat grass, do you? So it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how God recreates this situation. But we have the waters teeming with life and we have the skies teeming with birds. Now, I don't know about you, but birds fascinate me about as much as fish do. So this is a really great thing for me to talk about today. I want to bring up another friend who may or may not ever see this presentation. But she was a young person in one of my very first congregations. She is now an older person. And uh, to her credit, has just successfully lost 50 pounds. Okay, so as an older person trying to stay young and healthy, she is achieving great things. But one of the things she achieved while she was in college was the fact that she wanted to, in her marine biology uh, experiments, she wanted to do a paper on the parasites. You didn't think that I was going to stay big all the time, right? The microscopic parasites that live between the scales. You didn't think that sharks had scales, did you? Yes, they have scales. Between the scales of the shark, there are parasites that live and cause the shark to actually get a sore, to get a disease on the side of its body. This is a young person who's interested in the intricacies of what happens in the life of a shark and is interested in knowing how you know, there can be maybe some intervention that is done, but that there is a parasite that is microscopic that lives between the scales of a shark. So that shark skin suit from the 70s that kind of shimmered, yes, those were scales that were shimmering and uh, uh, the fashion industry tried to do its best to make suits that looked like that. Here she is studying the, the very tiny, tiny parasites that are, are sucking the lifeblood out of, of sharks. Her name is Jenny D. She used to work in Atlanta at the Atlanta Aquarium. Uh, now she is working uh, at the National Aquarium in Baltimore uh, and is, is a senior biologist there for the National Aquarium. Wonderful, wonderful trajectory in life and knows so much. When I visited her in Atlanta several times where she was one of the uh, biologists in charge of open oceans. If you've ever been to Atlanta, please, 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 the main attraction as far as I'm concerned in Atlanta is not the Coca-Cola plant. Okay, It is the aquarium which is actually five aquariums in one. And she was one of the marine biologists in charge of open oceans where there were not one, not two, but three whale sharks. Now that whale shark is, is from me to Jason. And it doesn't eat anything but krill. Raise your hand if you know what a krill is. It looks like a bug that lives in the ocean. It's tiny, tiny. And they feed this shark by dumping the krill in front of it as it's coming along and suddenly you see those krill just go and he sucks them, sucks them in and that's what a whale shark, the biggest of sharks, uh, eats. So here you, have, here you have on this day the waters teeming with life underneath the surface of the water. And then in the sky you have birds. Um, my favorite thing about birds is their feathers. If you look at me gardening, you will see that I have a hat which I have stuck uh, at least 10 different kinds of feathers into that I have just found around. And, and so I go around my community sometimes with this hat on and it's got lots of feathers in it. How many of you have had the wonderful experience of looking at a bird feather under a microscope? Okay, maybe you've seen pictures. Uh, uh, what I think of is Velcro. Okay, it could be, and I think if my memory serves me, that this is what inspired Velcro. 
that each strand of that feather has hooks on it. And that, I don't know if you've done this, but I've done this, when you take a feather that you find that is kind of torn apart, you can actually squish it in just the right way and suddenly those torn apart pieces line up together and suddenly the feather is now back together and you can blow on it and it acts more like a sail like it's supposed to than when it was ripped apart. I mention all these things simply because this is what happened out of the imagination of our God. On the fifth day, God said, let the waters teem with life. So those crazy creatures like the moray eel or, or squid or octopi, plural of octopus, I mean, they come out of a, an imagination which we can appreciate. Where was Jesus at this moment? Last week and again this week, I want to remind you that John chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that in the beginning, at this moment, in the beginning of the world, because the world had a beginning, God does not have a beginning, but the world had a beginning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was made flesh. The Word was God, and that there was nothing created that He did not participate with the creation. So first, this morning, I want us to remember that Elohim is plural. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They were thinking creatures that are created on this day. You have flourishing seabeds and beautiful skies where the birds are living, making their nests in various places as they still do to this day. Can you imagine the singing? Now they tell me that if I want to see a lot of bird life that is most unusual, that I should go to Costa Rica. But if you press her, my wife Chris will, tell you, will, will, will bring up on her phone a recording of the mockingbird that lives at various times in the year right outside our front door, which in the summertime stays open with the screen locked. That mockingbird, uh, some have said I should do away with because it's irritating because it's so loud because it's going to wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and it's going to sing until the sun comes up she has a recording of this mockingbird and it is singing all kinds of songs which is its habit to mimic the songs that it, that it hears and in fact in these days uh, uh, birds have heard your cell phones and there are some birds now, like the mockingbird, that actually make cell phone noises because this is what they have heard. I want you to know that I have played with this mockingbird. And you think, oh my goodness, the pastor has gone crazy. No, no, I have decided if this mockingbird is interested in other noises, I'm going to make some noises and see if he is interested. Well, guess what? He's not. He, he's interested in competition, though. And so I will make a noise, a bird-type noise, and he will then make his own noise. Then I will mimic him, and he will then make another noise to see if I will still mimic him. And we have had five minutes like this at times when I will make a noise and he will make an even bigger, louder noise that's bigger and better than mine. So while he's guarding his mate, who is sitting on a nest that we believe is somewhere in our bushes next to our, our front door, uh, uh, he is making these noises. And it's, it's, fun, it's fun to interact with him. On this day, on the fifth day, God creates animals that can think, animals that can, that can interact, that do so, uh, whether they're a school of fish in the sea or they're a group of birds that that look like a school of fish in the sky, or whether they're an eagle that's soaring higher and higher and is, is, is able to see on the ground because of the eyesight that was given 
to the eagles and or the, the bird raptors that can see that tiny little mouse so far, far down. But I, I, I'm, I'm hearing music. When, when I hear this creation day come, I'm hearing music because everywhere in the, is this amazing stereophonic sound that hasn't been part of the creation so far. But now you have birds in the sky and you have the song of the whale in the ocean. So my picture of Jesus today is that he's a conductor. Bunny, I, I, I thought you might like this one. He, he's a conductor, and, and, and it's his imagination that is literally taking shape. Out of his mind is, is coming the ideas for all of these in their fullness and in their place. What he thinks is, is coming into being in detail. And, and if you read this passage, you read how many times the review that he gives himself is that it's good. And it was good. God has no peer. He has no review board. When uh, Job's friends wanted to give God a review and Job just sat and listened and was thinking about reviewing God, God comes on at the end of the book of Job. If you want to read this as your homework for this afternoon, please do. God says to him, where were you? On day five, when I made the Leviathan, where were you? So to the ears of God at this moment, he, as, as he is conducting this, this situation and he is now hearing, he's now hearing the music of the creation that he has made. Jesus, the Jesus of the Gospels, I, I see him as the conductor you see, because he was there. John tells us that he was there at this moment and that, in fact, he is the God who created. So if you want to know about Jesus, he gives us that first book. He gives us that first book. Before the Bible, there was creation. There was everything to look at, including the sea and the fish and the air and the birds. In Matthew chapter 4, uh, I just wanted to make a correlation uh, quickly that, that I think you will enjoy. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. And it's, it's an interesting moment. Uh, see what you think. Jesus is going to begin his ministry. And so I see him as the conductor with his baton in his hands. But now you see he's already been the creator. And now he's coming back to the world and he's going to reveal who God is. And on our journey this year where we have decided that we want to turn our eyes upon Jesus, I thought that reviewing the fact that Jesus is the creator needs to be connected in our minds. And, and so this is the connection that I'm wanting you to see. Jesus is there in... in uh, Matthew chapter 4, and this is what it says in verse 12 of Matthew chapter 4. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum, which was now going to become his headquarters for his ministry, which was by the lake of the, in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of, to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness, what? Have seen a great light. Do you, do you hear the, the creation story being told again? This is the God who has turned on the lights in our world. This is the God who has made the firmament. This is the God who has made the sky. He is now, he is now coming back and he is going to recreate. Have you ever thought of that? That his first coming is also a recreation. In verses 23 and onwards, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching what? The good news of the kingdom. When God creates the world, he reveals himself. 
He shows what he is like and he says, this too now is part of my kingdom. The fish in the sea, the birds in the air are my creation. They are part of my kingdom. Jesus is coming and he's saying, the good news is the kingdom is here. And healing every disease and sickness among the peoples. The word healing is similar to the word for peace. What do we call Jesus? We call him the Prince of Peace. Because he is also the one who heals us back together with God. Which God? According to Revelation 14.7, the Adventist church teaches that it is the God of creation. Why are you sitting here on Sabbath, my friends, as Adventists? You are sitting here because you are worshiping the God of creation. Here is the announcement, in fact, of the beginning of his ministry. And so what do we see? What do we hear from him? It's the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Does this not sound like creation to you? This sounds to me like creation. This This is God proclaiming, this is who's going to be part of my kingdom. The fish in the sea, the birds in the air. This is who's going to be part of my kingdom. Those who are poor in spirit, those who understand, this is is who I will bring into my kingdom. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. They will be part of my kingdom. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. They will be fed on the righteousness of God. They feast They feast on him. Have you ever thought about that at communion time? Here Jesus is saying, if you want to be part of my kingdom, this sounds like cannibalism, but he says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's metaphoric. We know it's a metaphor for the fact that we have to have an intimate relationship with God. We have to take him in to ourselves and become one with him. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted, okay, living in the valley of the shadow of death, living according to the principles of the kingdom of heaven. You are going to be persecuted. You are going to come up against opposition if you believe in the God of creation, if you live as one who is part of his kingdom. You are going to come against Those who have decided to live according to their own rules and make up their own way of living. So if today we see God uh, in Jesus revealing himself, the creator God coming back and saying, I am here, I am proclaiming the fact that my kingdom is back here and the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky are evidence of the fact that I am creator God. These are the kinds of people that will be part of my kingdom. You will be salt, you will be light. These are all representations of who God is. You will not do things the way that... Everyone else does things because now you're going to be part of my kingdom. It talks about murder. It talks about adultery. It talks about divorce. It talks about oaths. It talks about an eye for an eye. These are things that Jesus is talking about. And he's basically saying the system that you have here on this earth is not going to be the system that we will be living by in my kingdom. Instead... Chapter 6, he says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. Because if you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And you say, well, how come? Well, because you see, (laughs) the system of this world, they do their acts of goodness in front of everybody because they want everybody to notice. So he's really saying, if you want your heavenly father to notice, do things in a way that your heavenly father will notice. In fact, he sees everything, so you can do whatever you want in secret, but he'll know anyway. He'll know anyway. Because he's the God of creation. He's the God who knows. He's the God who created the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky. 
chapter 6, verse 19, uh, becomes very clear at this point. If you buy into this kingdom, if you want to be part of this kingdom, he says, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth. Don't buy in to the economy, to the attitudes, and as we talked in Sabbath school today, to the metrics, the measurements of what people think in this world is right. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust can destroy, where thieves can break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven... Now, if we believe that Jesus' coming means that, that the heavenly kingdom began at that time, then being part of his kingdom, we're storing up things according to the way that the heavenly storehouses are filled. Love, righteousness, joy, peace. These are the things with which the heavenly storehouses are full, and it is something that thieves cannot take away. For where your treasure is, verse 21, there will your heart be also, let's say it the other way around. Where your heart is, is probably going to be where you put your treasure. So we can today, we can today uh, reaffirm our love for the creator God by saying, we give you our hearts. But let's be real. If we're going to give him our hearts. The Bible is just saying where our hearts are, there will our treasure be also. In, let's put it in investment terms. Where we invest our lives, that's going to be where we spend our time. So the question has to be asked. Where's your heart today? Where's your heart? Because where your heart is there will be your investment. That's, that's what you'll do. That's what you will invest your life in. And I'm just going to say it. This is the God of heaven. This is the God who made the birds. This is the God who made the fish. I, I don't know about you. I want to live with him forever. I, 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 I really don't understand people who are basically saying by not giving their hearts, by not giving their treasure, by not buying in, I, I, I just don't understand why they wouldn't. With eternity on the line. I'm going to jump to the very end. Revelation 22. You've heard me say this before. Behold, Jesus says, I come quickly. Now remember, he counts differently from us. 2,000 years since he resurrected, we might think that's a long time, but it's quick in the eyes of God. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, my friends. He is going to give every single human being the deepest desires of their hearts. So if your heart is in him, is in his kingdom, if your heart and your treasure is invested in his, your life is invested in his kingdom, then he is, he is going to give you the desires of your heart, which will be to live in his presence, unimpeded by the situation in this world today, because that's all going to pass away. We will live in his presence. If that is the desire of your heart, he is promising he will give that to you. I said this, said this to Sam. Sam and I were talking this week. It is going to be hard. It's going to be hard for you to get away from God. So I don't know about you. If you've been, if you've been running away from God this week, give it up. He's going to run you down. He's going to run you down and he's going to tell you how much he loves you. And he's going to tell you again and again and again till you get it. He loves you that much that he wants you to live forever with him. He wants you to swim with the fishes and fly with the eagles. How about it? Amen. Amen.